boys and girls, what you're about to see is out of this world. Step right up now, don't be shy, because we're about to show you how cars can David Hilster, I am your host today for Saturday Science Chats, and we've got a great program. You don't want to miss it today. Our mathematical system's all screwed up. That's a pretty big deal. Yes, sir. Re. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. The, I know there are people around the world. We're getting more and more people here. So let me start out. I always uh, start out with my little slideshow. Keeps me organized here. And of course, you have tuned into Saturday Science Chats, sponsored by the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and Dissident Science. Science? <laughs> Dissident Scientist? No. Dissident Science. You can... Uh, Check us out at naturalphilosophy.org and youtube.dissidentscience.com. And I want to welcome everybody from both those channels here today. And of course, we are going to talk about, before, uh, just to let you know, don't go away, we're going to be talking about the flaws in our current mathematical system. We're going to talk about what uh, Jack uh, Kirkendall calls a broken symmetry math. I love math and all of those people who think our mathematics is perfect. Ha, ha, ha. Think again. That's what we're going to be talking about today. But uh, before that, I want to thank everyone who's attending, who's watching this li live and also the recording. Without you, this doesn't happen. And it is growing. We are growing. It is amazing. We've been doing this for, oh my gosh, I think we started these Saturday morning chats in 2008. They've been off and on, but mostly on the last few years with our push into the social media world, we're starting to get more attraction. In fact, we passed 800 subscribers on CNPS. We blew right past that. We're about like 105, 805. Um, I want to thank my subscribers too. We're over 3,600 subscribers on Dissident Science. Remember, you're not going to get anything like this anywhere on the internet. We allow critical thinkers who we feel are worth hearing and if you have an idea or a theory or something out there that's a serious serious uh, subject that you've been working on and it doesn't go uh, with mainstream science we give you a platform because guess what that's where change comes from it doesn't come from within the mainstream it comes without from outside it so uh if you don't know about us i know we go over this every week but there's a lot of people this is their first time seeing this and the cnps the chappelle natural philosophy society it's named after john chappelle who started in the early 1990s a group of dissident scientists what we like to th call the critical thinkers first they were going against einstein's relativity and it grew and grew and grew until we have hundreds of members around the world now it's an organization that above all promotes critical thinking without malice to be an organization that supports publishes and promotes serious scientific work outside mainstream science and to provide a forum for open debate about modern topics in physics cosmology philosophy and mathematics today mathematics to provide a forum for presenting serious papers and theories without fear of censorship and let's see if I can get through this next sentence correctly <laughs> to be run and controlled in its entirety by its paid membership 
including the election of the directors and its members. So we are member run and how you can participate. Well, you can sign up on naturalphilosophy.org. It's a new website, brand new. We got hundreds of members, but they're still finding us. We're almost up to a hundred people registered uh, and getting back there uh, to our goal of a couple hundred people here, uh, actually over 300, and then consider becoming a member. The memberships are annual and monthly, and we do have both. And I want to thank everybody who is contributing. And of course, you can participate in our community discussions on our website. I just wish I get included. Luckily, unluckily, I don't know, in a lot of what we call email chains. What are email chains? Well, that's when people decide they're going to gather all the e these emails where they want people to have a platform, and then they send it out, and there's a discussion that ensues with reply all using email. The sad part of it is there's a lot of great discussion going on, and it's lost to the ether. No, no pun intended. That would be E-T-H-E-R, not A-E-A-T-H-E-R. And that's sad. So if you're thinking about doing these email chains, well, people say to me the reason they do that instead of going online to our forums in our discussion areas where people can watch what you do and get something out of what you do. Well, I don't want people in their fear. Well, we can make those um, discussions only allow the certain people to do them, but still be public. So, you know, please think about getting the discussions and letting everybody see what you're saying. If, if what you're saying is so important, then people want to know. And then people come to me, the same people come to me and says, no one's reading my work. Well, you do these kinds of things, that's what happens. I'm sorry, get off my soapbox, but folks, you're not, you're gonna die in a vacuum and that's why we are here. We're here to promote your work. We're here to give you a platform for your work and to discuss. And you know what's gonna happen if you do that? Your ideas and your models or whatever you think are gonna get better because the collective mind is better than the individual I know we can get into the philosophy of that. Yes, isolation and working with your cell, working on your own is very good, but eventually it's got to get out to the world, rest of the world. Um, at least that's, I think, the ultimate goal of science. So anyways, post news and happenings about our us on social media, please do let people know. And of course, our websites are naturalphilosophy.org. That's where our community is. We use Buddy Boss. It's a great um, platform. Our online magazine, Science Woke, we get quite a lot of reads there. If you want to read really uh, fun articles, really mind-tickling articles by the, the top critical thinkers of our time, and no, they're not in mainstream science, uh, check it out, sciencewoke.org. We also have a Wikipedia, because why, when we put in expansion tectonics in the Wikipedia, it gets thrown away. I mean, despite all the data that supports the theory of expansion tectonics. And once you really take a look at it, you'll, you'll agree. I don't, I'm not think I met too many people who I really admire who are critical thinkers that when they really looked at expansion tectonics, they go, you know, can't deny this one. So, um, but we, to uh, combat, combat that, we built a Wikipedia using Wikimedia, which is for you software nerds, is the open source Wikipedia um, software we use that and we have over 10,000 pages. And if you have your your profile there, you can get in contact with Nick Percival. He is our <clears throat> curator of the wiki, wiki.nationalphilosophy.org, which we do not allow to be open because the idea of an open Wikipedia is that it's a consensus and consensus will always crush anybody's new ideas, even if they're right. If Einstein was around in the, during Wikipedia, they wouldn't let him publish anywhere. So there you go, which is ironic, even though he's wrong. Um, and of course, we have our Chappelle University, with, which we are uh, working on. So, And also, we have memberships and donations. How can you do that? Go to naturalphilosophy.org. You can go to members, click on the pay membership or donate, and we get both, and I appreciate it. We get uh, donations, sometimes one-time donations, and we also you can also sign up for the monthly from $5 to $50 monthly, and from yearly from $35 to $500 all the way up, and I want to thank our patrons. Patrons are people who go above, above and beyond, and we are a not for profit. No, we're not a 5013C. If you want to know what we are, go to the website. We tell you what we are. I think it's a one. I don't know. 
I'm not going to remember a uh, number. So um, I want to thank Dr. Cynthia Whitney, who's been generous with us for the, the past many years. And she is, of course, our chief uh, scientist from MIT with a degree in relativity. And, um, and she knows special relativity didn't work. Uh, I say that every time I know folks. But remember, there are a lot of people watching all of this for the first time. Nick Percival, I want to thank him uh, greatly for his generous donations this year. Duncan Shaw, when I've uh, needed to have people and shake the tree of our patrons, his patrons and say, hey, I've got some great crazy software we want to use. They actually go along with it. But uh, Duncan says, I'll, I'll do it if you do it. Uh, I trust what you're doing. And um, uh, that's that's great because I do it because I want to get our voices out there. So, uh, and believe me, it's not the way to become famous. If you think I'm doing this for fame, <laughs> but I'm not that stupid. This is not what you do. You can do like Sabine Hassenfelder and talk about general things and become a science evangelist. Then you, uh, but I want truth in science. So that's why I don't go that way. So fame, it's stupid anyways. Um, and anonymous donor, uh, I want to thank him. And um, Robert D. Hilser has made some do donations as well as has Kurt Renshaw. So thank you very much. And if you want to become a patron, come in contact with me. You can send us a check. You can uh, pay online. There's a, you can do it online. It's greatly appreciated. And all, oh, by the way, Super Chats last week, hand, hands, um, uh, hats off to everybody. Hats off to everybody who uh, contributed to the Super Chat. What's a Super Chat? I, I told my dad, hey, we got Super Chats. He goes, He's 83 and has his own YouTube channel, doesn't know what a Super Chat is, but that's okay. Uh, a Super Chat is where we're doing these chats on um, uh, YouTube. You can actually uh, contribute. You can make a donation of, and I think, anything, almost anything, a dollar on up. And that money goes to the channel. And uh, we, of course, use that for everything we're doing here because it costs us thousands and thousands of dollars to use all the software we have. StreamYard is, is software. Our software on our website is uh, subscription-based. We have our server, which is subscription-based. We have our security, which is $100 or $200 a year because people like to hack us because we are against mainstream, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you, I, everything is appreciated, even the Super Chat. And also, I will tell you, if you do put a Super Chat out there, I will read your comment on air for sure. That's guaranteed because of your donation. We give it back by answering your question or reading your comment. So you can uh, use the Super Chat. All right. And... Um, so members, uh, stuff that's going on, and my dad happened to be uh, the, I think, only member to put out a video this week, but uh, very interesting video. If you haven't checked it, uh, seen it, check it out. It's at Particle Guru. Go to Particle Guru from the YouTube channel. The Speed of Light versus C. It's really good. I, actually, this is a really great one because he talks about the history of it and uh, super, super, you know, uh, I, I tell my dad, he, he hits on some good videos once in a while. No, they're always interesting to me but uh this one's maybe more of a broader interest but uh, a very interesting uh, video on speed you see the speed of light versus c did you notice that are you catching that dad's pretty clever at 83 i guess at 83 you, you know a lot more than you do when i like me at 61 so um also i didn't put this up and it is really really um uh, uh, great is the CMPS is a publisher and we have three books coming out uh, this year um, and those three you can see over here um, let me get my pointer my laser pointer there we go over here you can see the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society we do use Overleaf Overleaf.com is a online sharing uh, publishing uh, a place where you can make books and make papers in the same format called latex which they use for publishing so if you want to write your book you can use that every paid member has access to that so you can write papers in it and we, we will be announcing in march the the uh, uh, start of our cmps 2001 virtual conference which will be held the near near more near the end of the year and we will have proceedings with that and the proceedings will be made into a book we'll be using our overly system and we will be announcing that soon and i'm sure the moment i announce ray gallucci if you're watching we'll get five papers from him right away ray gallucci is our most prolific um public um 
writer of papers. I've got a number of papers I want to put in there, and I'm sure a lot of people out there have some papers they would run, want to write. You will be published as we'll, we take a look at it. We've rejected papers before. We're not. We do not accept conspiracy theory stuff. We can. We accept science and math. And if it's a serious attempt, and we think it's a serious attempt. We will let you can criticize anything you want. You can say the Big Bang's wrong, relativity's wrong, anything you want. You can say mathematics is wrong as long as it's it's a a well written paper. It's got um, uh, uh, how do you say a scientific structure. It's logical. We will publish, but we don't do religion. We don't do conspiracies. We don't do UFOs. Those are things that we do not include. And people ask me, well, why don't you? And the answer is simple. We have a few other problems to resolve before we worry about UFOs. How about like all of physics needs to be redone in cosmology as well? We got to throw out relativity, plate, plate tectonics you can throw out. We need to do expand. We've got so much on our plate. Let's concentrate sort of on that first. And then, you know, it'd be great to worry about the others. But let's talk about the three books. There's Not Finity by George Coyne. He, if you haven't seen that, go to both Dissident Science and the CMPS YouTube channel. If you haven't checked, uh, seen George Coyne, love him. That guy, I love his brain, the way he works. He's got his book ready. We uh, are ready to publish that. There's also another one coming out, 442 pages called The Ether. Yes, Ramsey wanted to... Uh, spell ether this way, but it is what we consider normally. Normally, A E T H E R. Why do we care? Because ether is actually a substance or a gas, or um, it's it chem it's got a real thing. Uh, what we mean, the ether, meaning the supposed medium of which light waves go through. And of course, we have the particle model coming out too, my father and I. So all these are coming out this year. Oh, and we also have, I've started to pattern our covers. It's very similarly, so people will know what we are publishing. And since most people are like, big deal, we, we try to make it so that um, you know, he wanted a picture of the cosmos, the, that picture of the cosmos, that's, that's that um, cover. Here's our cover for a Principia, Principia Mathematica 2. Yes, yes, we named it that. And yes, we believe we extended it. Yeah, so are we right or wrong? That's up to the world to describe. But yeah, it's coming out. We're still working on it. My dad and I, um, it's getting closer and closer. Um, we're getting really excited. We have a bunch of readers for it. If you're interested in reading and helping us out with the book, give us contact. Go to principiamathematica2.com. That's with the number two. And um, play the bumper, coming bumper. See, if I didn't have all those things, I wouldn't know what to do here. So make sure I push on the chrome. You see, are you next? Well, it turns out that I'm getting a lot of requests for people wanting to present, and it looks like uh, Nick and myself, Nick um, uh, Percival, we're sort of the ones who uh, look into whether or not, sometimes I'll ask the opinion of, of someone else of whether or not we bring people on, and, and he says, yeah, we're going to talk talk to Phil uh, Borkard, I guess, I guess you would pronounce this, this say, I don't know, Bo Bo I don't, don't even try. People can spell anything in English the way they want and pronounce it anyway. But he has a book called The Finite Theory. You can probably check that out. It's on Amazon. But uh, we are looking to have him come on board. Of course, uh, not in February. Why? I have the videos. Because I make so many of these graphic. No, uh, today's the last. Yeah, no, he's coming. He'll be coming back on. If you haven't checked it out, check out our conversation with Dr. Alexander Unsker. Read the Higgs fake read the Higgs fake and read the Higgs fake. I would make a required reading for anybody who studies physics on the planet Earth. Why? Because it reveals, it pulls back the curtain of the sham of how they supposedly discover particles in the particle accelerator. It is, 
it's sad. It's sad. It's sort of like politics more than it is science. But anyways, uh, also coming is Steve Bryant. I got to, he is just a busy guy, but uh, I haven't checked it out. He has his book. I think it's on Amazon. So you can try, try the disruptive, the, the demise of relativity. You can also read about it. And I'm still looking to Sky Scholar. Um, he's probably checking us out and trying to figure out, do I want to come on this crazy program with this crazy Dave? Um, but um, he is um amazing if you have not subscribed to his channel please do so brilliant man he also has taken up you can see he's a kindred spirit because he has put a relativity wrong on he's put on stephen crothers you can see him down under boy he's got some marketing skills there he went for the to the ohio state university and he's still working there. And I went to the Ohio State. And why do we do that? Anyways, <laughs> um, he also talks about bending light. And he had, um, of course, uh, Dr. Dowdy, who recently passed. Um, we talked about that last week. He's got a uh, presented with um, on his channel. So I think it's over 30,000 um, subscribers. So check that out. Subscribe. Remember, subscribe all these people. And of course, we give we are giving critical thinkers a platform. Are you next? And um, you can be next. And actually, like I said, we are now getting requests of people who want to come on the show. And they called it, you know, your amazing show or they're being really nice about it. So be polite and, you know, talk to us about like we're really you know amazing show and stuff. i'm kidding i'm kidding folks but anyways um the truth of the matter is um you can present if you have something you have been working on and you want to present it again you don't have to present it live you can have a recording of it a lot of people prefer doing that instead of doing a live uh, show but it's up to you either way we take take we will consider pretty much anything if it has to do with physics cosmology philosophy or uh, mathematics and of course, it's got to be pretty serious work, not just what we call science poetry and lots of words about with energy and stuff like that. So, um, and of course, uh, if you are working on it, on your work, uh, whatever that is, keep working on your passion. I say this every uh, week. Um, you know why? Because I don't judge what you're doing as correct. And other people in our group don't. Uh, who judges it is history and time if what you're working on um, is worth it and really people think it's really great work it will be adopted it will be used it will be copied it will be uh, borrowed and made even better and that's one of the reasons maybe you want to get it out there uh, because um, uh, what good is it if it's just sitting around but keep working on your passion whatever that is we are here to support you so today we're going to be talking about broken symmetry math, and um, we are going to play our bumper. Thanks, Dave, for putting that one in, too. Yes, we're not quite there, but who we're going to be talking to again is Jack Kirkendall, physicist, mathematician. He's got a degree from Georgia Tech in physics. Hey, Georgia Tech's a pretty darn good school for a uh, technical school. I know because I work for LexisNexis. I'm in the supercomputing department, and we have we work with Georgia Tech. So really good stuff. And he was assistant research scientist and met in the magnetics department. He's author of S Symmetry Math System, Rewriting Math, Physics, and Chemistry, and in 2005 discovered the rule of science in current math is incorrect. And I think we're going to be talking about that today. I don't know. Do I have any more slides? Oh, um, yeah, I guess um, some of the things, some of his findings that math errors in special relativity, quantum mechanics, mass and motion, he, th these are things that are, he talks about as everything's really mass and motion. His system of math is about that. Again, check us out. I think it was February 6th. Our show on February 6th, check it out. Really great. He talks about and gives a, gives a talk on symmetry math. Uh, mass is always in motion relative to other masses. Time allows human brain to distinguish between masses and motions. There's lots of other things here. But uh, without further ado, let me take this down and bring up Jack Kirkendall. Hey, Jack, how are you? It just doesn't get much better. Life's good. Okay, I guess. And you've like, are you moved in the same area or are you... I, I'm down in a different area today, so we've got oh, a different background. 
wow, it looks really important. It almost looks like a column behind you, like a Greek column. So there you go. Um, so um, tell, tell me about uh, uh, today. We're going to be uh, seeing a, um, uh, a video of yours. And I'm going to get start preparing that. But why don't you tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, remember a lot of people didn't see this maybe their first time seeing us live or recording. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the symmetry math and maybe, you know, just briefly about that, but about what we're going to see today in your uh, lecture. What you're going to see today is how I got started even developing symmetry math in that um, around the year 2000, I was looking at uh, some physics I was reading and it said something uh, was bumping up against other things in the nucleus and, and said something was going on. I says, well, if that's true, a negative times a negative uh, uh, or negative time to positive equals a negative can't be true. And so I'm going to look it up and just see that it's true and I'll be done with this. And when I looked it up, uh, the very start of the presentation will be a math book saying you can't prove the, the rule of science. And it was like, ah. And so that kicked off a four and a half to five year study of what I call breaking the dash cross codes. And uh, in traditional math, I call it broken symmetry math. And that's fairly easy to pick up and anyone to understand. If you take the traditional number line, they call one side negative and the other side positive. And the math they do on the negative side of the line is different than the math they do on the positive side of the line. So just by definition, the symmetry is broken. And so starting uh, with that, I then developed uh, um, breaking this dash cross code because the current math system is believed to be one of the greatest inventions of the human mind. And obviously numerous physicists believe math is what really controls the universe and everything else is, follows that. And once you start looking into it, you see that they use the dash for multiple, multiple different things. And they use the cross for multiple, multiple different things. And they don't designate what any of them are. They just simply use that rule of signs uh, for subtraction, addition, directions in space. Um, uh, and the whole list will be shown once you look at the video. And it winds up that there's just numerous, numerous errors in the traditional broken symmetry mass system. So I, I think this would probably be a good place to start the video. Okay, well, that's going to be great. Uh, we're going to take a look at it. So I'm going to take you down here and make sure I uh, do this correctly. Um, uh, get the sharing right. And remember afterwards to take off the audio because those using StreamYard will know about that, how that works. I don't want to get this echo back. So I have the share screen. I'm going, there is the screen uh, one. I will say share audio. I'm saying this so that people know what I'm doing here. Since uh, I don't have a person, hey, if you're if you're wanting to be part of this show, the production of this show every Saturday, let me know. Give me a shout out, and you can be part of it because I think the show's growing. We're going to be needing people to curate the comments and get them online for us, all those kinds of things. So here we go. Let's uh, share this uh, screen, and uh, should work fine. And those in the green room, and Jack, if you can see me, also Ian and James in the green room, please let me know thumbs up that you're going to be hearing this. Okay. I'm going to share it, then we'll start it. Broken symmetry, VS Math's rule of signs, cannot be proved. From What is Mathematics by Courant and Robbins, page 55, the rule minus 1 times a minus 1 equals a plus 1, which we set up to govern the multiplication of negative energies as a consequence of our desire to preserve the distribution law. A times B plus C is AB plus AC. It took a long time for mathematicians to realize that the rule of signs, together with all the other definitions governing negative integers and fractions, cannot be proved. They were created by us in order to attain the freedom of operation while preserving the fundamental laws of arithmetic. BS mathematicians should have discovered the problem. Instead, they invented symbols and definitions and bypassed the real problem, imaginary numbers and absolute values. 
After four years of working on the problem, on January 7, 2005, I broke the codes for the different uses of the dash and the cross symbols. Code one, the dash sign. The dash sign is used as a subtraction operator, is used as a direction in space labeled negative, whatever that means, and is used as an exponent to mean divide, is used to show the numbers of zeros to the right of a decimal point. A dash times a dash is used to multiply dashes times dashes and change them into crosses. And a dash times a cross used to multiply dashes times crosses and change them into dashes. A negative electron, whatever that means, negative mass, whatever that means. And in chemistry, thermal chemistry, enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy determine the final sign associated with a spontaneous process. Code two, the cross sign, a plus. Used as an addition operator, used as a direction in space, label positive, whatever that means. Used to show the numbers of zeros to the left of a decimal point. Used to multiply crosses times crosses and leaves them as crosses. And used to multiply crosses times dashes and change them into dashes. In physics, a positive proton, whatever that means, and a positive mass, whatever that means. In chemistry, again, thermal chemistry, enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy to determine the final sign associated with a spontaneous process. The same dash symbol is used for numerous different math operations. The definitions established for the use of the dash symbol do not distinguish between their different operations. In many math operations, the dash symbol has changed to mean one of the other two meanings. It is amazing that math has proceeded to its current level of use with this illogical use of a symbol. The same cross symbol is used for numerous different math operations. The definitions established for the use of the cross symbol do not distinguish between their different operations. In many math operations, the cross symbol is changed to mean the other meanings. Symmetry breaking. Because BS math uses the same symbol for different operations, they created a number line based on broken symmetry. The negative or dash side of the BS number line produces different answers than the positive or cross side of the BS number line. A dash times a dash is equal to a cross. A symbol on the left side of the BS number line multiplied by the same symbol on the left side of the BS number line is moved to the right side of the BS number line and the dash is changed to a cross. Not just subtraction, but double subtraction. This produces broken symmetry. A dash times a cross is equal to a dash. Anytime a dash is multiplied by a cross, the answer moves to the dash side of the number line. Again, it will be a double subtraction. This is broken symmetry. A cross multiplied by a cross is equal to a cross. All cross multiplications of crosses remain crosses. An addition symbol multiplied by an addition symbol remains an addition symbol. What is the meaning of multiplication of addition symbols? Symmetry is not broken. However, multiplying symbols that have different meanings without specifying the meaning is illogical. The BS math system originated with broken symmetry in the XYZ plane, originated with mirror broken symmetry in the XY plane, created an illogical rule of signs that cannot be proved to preserve the distributive law, created imaginary numbers to compensate for broken symmetry, created absolute values to compensate for incorrect answers from the rule of signs and negative numbers, and produced broken symmetry graphs for numerous functions, and the dash side of the graph is different from the cross side of the graph. The symmetry math system. It returns symmetry to the XYZ plane, removes the bilateral and mirror broken symmetry of the Cartesian coordinate system provides a logical rule of signs. An arrow in this direction and an arrow in this direction stays in this direction. An arrow in that direction and an arrow in that direction stays in that direction. And multiplications of arrows does not exist. 
it removes BS error in the distributive law, removes imaginary numbers, which means that all math using imaginary numbers must be abandoned and replaced with SM, quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's equations, Einstein's special relativity. It removes absolute values. It produces symmetrical gas for all functions and shows the math error in Einstein's special relativity. One of Einstein's math errors was due to the use of the BS math distributive law, and his second error was multiplying a direction to the left by a direction to the right. Bravo. Named the Cartesian coordinate system after the French mathematician René Descartes, the idea of this system was developed in 1637 in two writings by Descartes and independently by Pierre de Fermat. BS was established before the age of science. In 1610, Galileo published an account of his telescopic observation of the moons of Jupiter, using this observation to argue in favor of the centered world. And in 1687, uh, Newton's Mathematic was published, and in 1820, Faraday had uh, showed electricity and magnetism. Broken symmetry BS math. Why a negative times a negative does not equal a positive. It took four years of study to discover why BS math only works in an imaginary world where space in the dash direction is different from space in the cross direction. Started working on the problem in August of 2001 and solved in January of 2005. BS math rule of science is illogical. A negative times a negative equals a positive, a negative times a positive equals a negative, and a positive times a positive equals a positive. In BS math, no distinction is made between a subtraction operator and an addition operator, a direction in space, or multiplication of dashes times crosses. This is where the problem exists. Data points created using BS math produce graphs that are not symmetrical dash side different from the cross side. The examples will be shown later. However, if a real problem space data points follow the non-symmetrical graph, the graph can provide usable answers. This is why no one discovered the problem. Symmetry math, SM. If we specify that the dash sign means only subtraction and the cross sign means only addition, and an appropriate symbol is used for a direction in space, space becomes symmetrical. Math operators and directions in space are not the same, and the same symbol should not be used to represent them. A dash multiplied by a dash equals a cross. A negative times a negative equals a positive, and a left times a left equals a right. Illogical BS math. The negative is not just subtracted, it is moved by the same amount to the right side of the number line. Double subtraction. If you use symmetry math, which is logical, the subtraction of a direction in this way the, goes in the opposite direction that way. The subtraction of a direction is equal to the opposite direction. The answers are correct using correct logic. There is no multiplication of a subtraction operator by a direction in space. There's just the subtraction of a direction in space. If instead of labeling the left side of a coordinate system as negative, the same as a subtraction operator, we label it with an arrow to represent the direction, then a subtraction from that direction will be in the opposite direction. This is single subtraction. The direction arrow ahead returns to the zero point on the number line. In illogical BS math, a negative times a positive is a negative. A subtraction times an addition is a subtraction. A direction to the left multiplied by a direction to the right is a direction to the left. And a dash times a cross is equal to a dash. A negative, whatever that means, multiplied by a positive, whatever that means, is equal to a negative. This is illogical. A subtraction operator multiplied by an addition operator is equal to a subtraction operator. This is illogical. A direction to the left multiplied by a direction to the right is a direction to the left. This is illogical. A dash multiplied by a cross is equal to a dash. This is illogical. The symmetry math logical explanation is simple. 
A subtraction of a direction is the opposite direction. The subtraction of a direction is changed to the opposite direction. A positive times a positive equals a positive. An addition operator multiplied by an addition operator is equal to an addition operator. And a cross multiplied by a cross equals a cross. P.S. Math. What is the meaning of multiplying addition operators? They are separate math functions. B.S. Math is illogical. A number multiplied by a direction gives a number times that direction. And multiplied by a direction in the opposite direction gives a number in the opposite direction. A number times a direction maintains the same direction in SM logical math. In SM, the addition of a direction is in the same direction. There is no multiplication of addition operators. Again, SM math is logical. For hundreds of years, BS math has obtained usable answers to certain equations. Math books need to be changed to eliminate the use of the cross sign to represent something labeled a positive direction in space and the use of a dash sign to represent something labeled a negative direction in space. Space does not have positive and negative directions. SM uses arrows for directions. All observers see the same direction. Using BS math, the left side of the number line, defined as the negative side, is different from the math on the right side of the number line, defined as the positive side. Symmetry is broken. The square root of minus 1 does not exist. The square root of minus 1 squared equals minus 1. In BS math, if you square something that does not exist, it exists. This is illogical. Negative and positive directions in space. If I ask you to point to a negative direction in space, which way would you point? <laughs> Hopefully you will realize that there's no such thing as a ne negative direction in space. If I asked you to point to a positive direction in space, which way would you point? Again, hopefully you will realize that there is no such thing as a positive direction in space. The BS math number line is broken symmetry in the X, Y, and Z axis. BS math on the left, down, and back side of the BS math number line is different from the math on the right, up, and front side of the BS math number line. Objects on the right of the x-axis are positive. Objects on the left of the x-axis are negative. Negative math is different from positive math. This is illogical. Objects on the top, the y-axis, are positive. Objects on the bottom of the y-axis are negative. Objects in the front of the z-axis are positive. Objects in the back of the z-axis are negative. Again, BS math of the positive directions right, up, and front is different from BS math of the negative directions left, down, and back. Left and right, front and back, up and down axis have broken symmetry. I've placed an observer 2 in the back of the z-axis and an observer 1 in the front of the z-axis. In BS math, mirror image is broken symmetry in the X and Z axis. If the left and right axis are reversed, symmetry is broken. Observer 1 math is different from observer 2 math. If the front and back axis is reversed, symmetry is broken. Observer 1 math is different from observer 2 math. If the top and bottom axis are reversed, symmetry is not broken. Observer math is the same as observer 2. Negatives and positives. There are no negatives in math or space directions. This was just a poor choice of words and symbols. There is nothing negative about space. It is just a direction. In math, the dash symbol should only mean to subtract. It does not mean something is negative, whatever a negative means. There are no positives in math or space directions. In math, the cross symbol should only mean addition. It does not mean something is positive, whatever a positive means. When a direction arrow is used for the dash symbol and the word negative is removed, 
the answers come out correctly for adding and subtracting directions in space. You do not need the invention of imaginary numbers. The left side of this shows Barry Mazur's imaginary number in book in which I squared or I is the square root of minus one. So if you uh, carry out the math here, you'll find out that the square root of minus two is I times 1.414. If you use symmetry math and you use arrows for directions, uh, you simply have the, the square root of two moving in this direction. And so it's 1.414 moving in the direction of the arrow. Symmetry math is logical. A subtraction of one direction in space means to move in the opposite direction. So the subtraction of a direction to the left is a direction to the right. This, does, this is not the multiplication of a dash times an arrow. The subtraction of a direction to the right is a direction to the left. This is not multiplication of a dash times an arrow. Symmetry math is logical. The subtraction of an arrow pointing in any direction is an arrow pointing in the opposite direction. In BS illogical math, a dash times a dash equals a cross. A negative times a negative is a positive. A negative subtraction operator multiplied by a negative direction in space equals a positive direction in space. This is totally illogical. And a negative times a positive equals a negative. A dash times a cross equals a dash. So a negative subtraction operator multiplied positive direction in space equals a negative direction in space. BS math is illogical. Addition of arrows means to move in the same direction. The top line is an addition of direction to the left is a direction to the left. Symmetry math is logical. An addition of direction to the right is the direction to the right. Again, symmetry math is logical. And now the second line, a cross times a dash equals a dash. An addition operator multiplied by a subtraction operator is equal to a subtraction operator. Multiplying subtraction and addition operators is illogical. A cross times a cross equals a cross. An addition operator multiplied by an addition operator is equal to an addition operator. Multiplying subtraction and addition operators is illogical. What is the meaning of multiplying addition and subtraction operators? BS math is illogical. If you use numbers in arrows, six in this direction and four in that direction is two in this direction. The results of arrows is the direction of the arrow with the greatest magnitude, logical symmetry map. A six in that direction, a four in this direction is a two in that direction. The resultant of arrows in the direction of arrows with the greatest magnitude, logical symmetry math. The illogical and incorrect BS math for the distributive law, A plus B squared. If we substitute positive numbers in the equation, the answers will be correct. When two positive numbers are added and squared, the BS math distributive law provides a correct answer. By definition in BS math, no number squared can ever be negative. Therefore, no squared number can ever be an arrow moving in the dash or negative direction if it is squared. In BS math, an addition operator multiplied by a subtraction operator is always equal to a subtraction operator. If this had not been used for the last 400 years, you would die laughing at the utter absurdity of this last statement. This is illogical and violates symmetry. If A is five and B is three, as long as A is greater than B, the BS math distributive law provides correct answers. BS math breaks down when B is greater than A. So if A is three and B is five, three minus five squared is minus two squared, which is plus four. So BS math always gives a positive answer. The answer should be two and two, which is a arrow pointing in the direction of the four. Symmetry math is logical, BS math is illogical and incorrect. Because by definition, the correct answer cannot be minus four in BS math. BS math produces incorrect answers. This is where the distributive law provides incorrect answers. It produces an answer of plus four because by definition, no number squared in BS math can be a negative number. Using incorrect BS math, the distributive law will give an incorrect answer of plus four. This is incorrect and illogical. 
since there can be no negative directions from a squared term in BS math, BS math must be revised. The BS math distributive law must be abandoned. All arrows inside brackets must be solved first. Then any number raised to any power will just be in the direction of the arrow. The reason BS math does not work is that it is multiplying an arrow going in one direction by an arrow going in another direction. Clearly, this is not logical. The numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, and minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and minus 4 need to be abandoned. Arrows are some notation that a specific for a direction must be used. The BS math is on top with their negative and positive, and symmetry math is on bottom with simply a number and an arrow. What does it mean to multiply uh, something going in one direction by something going in another direction? Since multiplication is just addition, what would 4 in the left direction times 4 in the right direction be? Would it be 16 in the arrow pointing this way or 16 in the arrow pointing that way? In symmetry math, arrow direction math, you cannot multiply arrows going in opposite or different directions. The middle two terms are not logical. You cannot multiply opposite directions. This is a major error in BS math. They multiply a dash, a direction to the left, by a cross, a direction to the right. This is illogical and produces incorrect answer. The distributive law, when opposite directions are multiplied, produces incorrect answers. Broken symmetry or BS math invents absolute values for displacement. Even for a simple displacement of a math, BS math invented a definition and absolute values to obtain something labeled a positive number answered. If, for example, a mass starts at negative 3, moves to plus 3, and then back to negative 1, BS math provides a usable answer without a definition or absolute values. A negative and then a subtraction operator multiplied by a negative direction in space gives you a negative plus 3, which gives you plus 2. The answer is correct, but the math is illogical. However, if an object starts at negative 1 and moves to positive 3 and then back to negative 3, BS math had to invent a definition of absolute values to provide a usable answer because now you have a, a negative 3 and then a subtraction operator multiplied by a negative 1, which changes it to a positive, and the answer must be, uh, comes out to be minus 2. So we put a little set of goalposts up here and call it absolute value and change the negative 2 to a plus 2. BS math makes up a definition that all displacements are positive. Since this example provides an answer with something labeled a negative, the positive definition must be added and minus two is changed to plus two. A definition is needed to arrive at a usable answer with BS math. In SM, absolute values and meaningless definitions of positive are removed. In SM, Mass and direction in space are defined by the direction and magnitude of the resultant of arrows. A 5 in that direction and a 7 in this direction is a total distance of 12 with a resultant of 2 in this direction. With SM, you get total distance traveled by the object and the final direction of the displacement. A 3 in that direction and a 4 in that direction is a 7 in that direction. A 4 in this direction and a 1 in this direction is a 5 in this direction. A 7 in that direction and a 5 in this direction is a total uh, distance of 12 with a displacement of 2 in that direction. This is an example of how imaginary numbers can produce incorrect answers. Uh, from Barry Mazur's book, Imagining Numbers, and Barry Mazur does his mathematics at Harvard University, where he is a, a university professor. Uh, Barry Mazur says, solve this equation using the distributive law, 1 plus the square root of minus 3 divided by 2 cubed. He says, do the computations carefully on paper using the rules we agreed to. 
then ponder your answer, which should be something of surprise to you. And my comments is definitely a surprise, is incorrect and illogical. Don't stop there. Think of what your answer might possibly mean or might imply. So if you go through this math, you'll come out with a, uh, that this uh, gives you an answer of minus one. And any of you who believe in BS math, you will actually agree with this and imaginary numbers. This is one of the errors of the rule of science caused from the distributive law. It produces answers that are incorrect. The biggest error Barry Mazur made was not checking his answer by solving the equation with the incorrect answer. If he had, he would have known that the answer was incorrect. So we'll set the one plus the square root of minus three divided by two cubed equal to one. Check answer by setting equal. So cube both sides and perform the math. And what you come up with is one plus the square root of three over two equals one. Now multiply both sides by two, and you come up with the square root of three equals minus three. Now you square both sides, and you come up with minus three equals nine, or minus one equals three. This is an incorrect answer. A simple equation check could distributive law using traditional math provides an incorrect answer. Symmetry math does not allow these incorrect answers to be calculated. Imaginary numbers are removed from symmetry math. The next few slides will show broken symmetry math equations that produce incorrect answers. The following equations cannot yield correct answers using BS math. The first equation is 2x minus x equals zero. And so add x to both sides. And so you have 2x equals x. And now let x equals one or two equals one. This is obviously an incorrect answer. The only answer that BS math can give is x equals zero. The above equation is easily solved with non-zero answers with symmetry math. The second equation is a equals b. This is the starting equation. Multiply both sides by a. Now subtract bb from both sides. Factor a minus b from both sides. Divide both sides by a minus b. Replace a with b. Simplify to 2b equals b. Let b equals 1 or 2 equals 1. Again, BS math yields an incorrect answer. Symmetry math solutions cannot use the same symbol for directions. So 2 to the right and 1 to the left equals 0. So add a left to both sides, and this turns the uh, left into a right. And, and now solve for r. So 2 times r over 2 and l is equal to 0, r and l equals to 0. So if you have a 2 in that direction and a 1 in this direction, and they need to equal 0, then you have to add uh, that direction to both sides. So 2 is equal to 1, and so the arrow to the that direction has to be 1 over 2 to this direction. So 2 times 1 half and 1 equals 0, a 1 in that direction and 1 in this direction equals 0. And so x squared and 3 in the opposite direction, uh, all you do is the math, and it comes out that the uh, x has to be 1.732 uh, squared to make it come out to 0. The incorrect answer results in the next example is the problem with the difference of squares. a squared minus b squared, which is factored into a minus b times a plus b. Symmetry math explains how this incorrect answer, incorrect answer is obtained. So we start with the a equals b. This is the starting equation. So I've set a equal to and b equal to. So now we multiply both sides by a. So we have 2 times 2 equals 2 times 2. Subtract BB from both sides. And now we have 2, 2, minus 2, 2, and 2, 2, minus 2, 2. And factor A minus B from both sides. And this is where traditional math breaks down. Traditional math rules multiply a subtraction operation by an addition operation. This is illogical. The answers cancel the middle two terms. The zero terms are canceled. And incorrect and illogical math follows. If you continue with traditional math, you get incorrect answers. Because we have a 0 times 4, you cannot go past step 3. 
dividing both sides by a minus b. You are canceling the zeros. This happens any time the left side of the number line is multiplied by the right side of the number line. The a minus b is removed from the calculation. This is not permitted in SM math. Replace a with b, simplify, and again, BS math yields an incorrect answer. You simply cannot separate, uh, you cannot do the a minus b and a plus b. The equations developed by Lorentz and Einstein for Einstein's special relativity used broken symmetry math. Since BS math makes no distinction between the different meanings of the dash and crosses used, it created illogical science to become the accepted theories of academia. From uh, fundamentals of modern physics, Einstein's math, uh, everyone has seen this is Einstein's equation to find the relative velocity of objects moving in the opposite directions in space. This is the figure used to illustrate that object one and two are separating from each other at less than the speed of light. The logical mind will see them separating at 1.8 C meters per second. However, BS math is not logical and produces an absurd answer. Uh, the acceptance of this illogical math has created illogical science for over a hundred years. Two objects going in opposite direction are going at less than the speed of C. Here is how the multiplication of dashes and crosses without any explanation of their relationship to objects moving in space over time caused illogical and incorrect answers to become an infallible theory in academia. The top equation shows a direction to the right, a subtraction operator, and a direction to the left. The bottom of the equation shows a subtraction of a direction to the left multiplied by a direction to the right. So the subtraction of the direction to the left multiplied by a direction to the left changes the subtraction operator into an addition operator and a direction from left to right. So when we do that, we get a 1.8c for the direction to the right. And now if we take the uh, left multiplied by a direction to the right and a direction to the left. A subtraction operator multiplied by the direction to the left becomes an addition operator. So when you go through BS math, you get a 1.81 divided into 1.8, and therefore it comes out to be less than C. The symmetry math's rule of signs would not have allowed the Lorentz Einstein's equation to be used. In symmetry math, you cannot multiply a subtraction operator times a direction in space, can only solve for the resultant. You cannot multiply a direction to the left times a direction to the right, and you cannot multiply opposite directions in space. What the Einstein equation says is that if you have something moving in point nine C uh, to one direction and you uh, add uh, point nine C in the opposite direction, the answer should be zero. And if you uh, take a subtraction operator and you try to multiply it, uh, something going to the right by something going to the left is totally illogical and not allowed. So the top one is zero and the bottom one is not allowed. The equation is illogical and produced the ridiculous Einstein uh, thing of light has only one speed. If you would like a word copy of this presentation, send an email to kuisg at aol.com. Thank you for listening. Okay, Jack, that was really great. Um, let me get this down here. There we go. So, um, all I have one question is really oh wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute there we go the echo's gone i've learned that sorry about that folks that should be okay now so uh i have one question when did you uh first um tackle special relativity and why um i think i don't really remember a date but um, special relativity never made any sense. And if you look at Einstein's definition of simultaneity, 
it's actually just one one way light system. It doesn't. In other words, he said if you send a signal out and it uh, reaches uh, two certain points at the same time, that's simultaneous. How does anything at those two certain points know uh, when they hit? How would you ever know when they hit? Like radar, for example, you have a return signal, and that, and if they hit at the same time, you know they were simultaneous if you know the distances were correct. And so just sheer logic said it made no sense. And uh, as I um, studied more, and basically when I seen Karnarev's work, uh, Professor Karnarev goes through a brilliant presentation on relativity and why it's false, and mainly is they remove time uh, from the X, uh, the prime axis, and you can't do that in math. So Professor Karnarev's math actually shows the the time era in special relativity. Yeah, and again, um, because our conference is coming up, I am. I was thinking the other day that I want to write a paper, and what the paper will be is to compare what Dr. Karazani found, which he found, I think, the same thing, but he had to do it in the real number system, and he he his objection was there were two V's that were being multiplied, and they couldn't be multiplied because they were different and couldn't what what he was what he found out was um you can you know you have equations but he had to dig through this and figure out what is he really describing in the physical world much like what you're saying is like look we have directions point to a negative direction in space you can't do it positive direction in space and what he what his his um explanation one of his explanations in the lorenz and in, in in special relativity was that the act of taking these two V's and multiplying them and making them squared was was could not be allowed because the physics wouldn't allow it. So what happened is what I think what you're saying is basically the same thing. And that is the mathematical system has its rules. And if you follow the mathematical system and its rules, you come up. And you can verify, make a check mark, and you can go to your physics 101. You can reproduce and regurgitate the calculations that Einstein went through for special relativity, the Wrens as well. And you'll get the answers that the mathematical system has. But in the, in the doing of that math, the, what's going wrong is that the system itself has illogical pro has. Uh, problems with it. And the other thing is, is that the negative sign is meaning more, like you said, than just one, one thing. If your system has one operator, that means more than one thing in the real world. And then you start treating those different operators as different things. Like if a V is a, is a direction, but now it's an operation, you're going to inevitably fall on your face. Is that is that kind of what you were, I mean, is that what you're sort of saying or? I, that, that's okay, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect explanation, I know, but I think what I think what I, like I said, what I wanna do is, uh, you can check it out, it's uh, uh, not you, but the audience can check it out, autodynamics.org. Autodynamics.org is based on uh, Dr. Karazwani's work. I was, that's how I got into this myself in the early 1990s. He showed Einstein's special relativity to be wrong. And I tried to help him get that information out before the internet and then the internet just came out. But in that process, I, I discovered, well, what did he really say? And what he was saying, I think ends up being the same. I think what you say can make it much clearer of what he had to try to find out. Because the problem people have with, with had with his work is they couldn't get past this idea and understand why two V's were different. And you can't just make an operation upon them. And, you know, a, a direction changes without, again, it was, it, it wasn't easy for people because they're working in the, um, you know, the BS math system, as you call it. Now, the, the simple thing to me is when you're looking at relativity and the um, graph that Einstein used where he showed, you know, two, two objects moving apart at point 0.9C, let's use two photons that you shoot off in opposite directions. And I don't care what an observer is doing and where an observer and where yet it's moving, there's no way he can say those things are not moving apart at 2C. I mean, this just, I don't 
and I don't care what they're doing because that's too, I mean, you can't tell me that you, you fire two photons out uh, in opposite directions and they're moving at less relative to see to each other. That's just illogical and nonsense. And if you produce an equation that says it does, then the equation has to be wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was, it was, um, Another person, a brilliant person in our group, Dr. Peter Marquar, he's in my film, Einstein Wrong, and he says it pretty clearly, he says, special relativity is a, an observer, uh, is an observer um, idea. It's not, a, it's not a theory or a set of equations about the events. It can't be so. what's physically happening. Yes. If so can't right. tell what's happening, doesn't mean that's not what's happening. Right. And my father said much the same thing. He says, look, and I have too. I think we've all, many of us have said the same thing. Look, this event is happening in the, in the universe. This is what's happening. Your observing of it only makes a difference as if you stand in the way. If you stand in the way of a train, the train's going to hit you. It's going to slow it down a little bit. But um, this whole idea that that there's some system or mathematics or theory behind the idea of observation is just it, it just makes no sense. There's events and movement in the world, and that's pretty much it. Let's see. We've got a gajillion comments. Um, this is I'm going to try to pick out some. I have to go back through here. It says math cannot be devoid of direction in 3D. And you're basically saying exactly that um, there's a direction, right? That something yes. is going a direction. And of course, that direction only matters to anything if there's something else there, right? Uh, right. It's got to be an observer. And if you put a uh, an arrow going somewhere, I don't care where the observer is observing from. He will see the arrow going in the direction of the arrow. Right, right, right. Um, let's see here. I'm going to go back on some of these. Oh, I, oh, okay. I got somebody in the green room raising their hand. So, uh, again, if you want, I'm going to get my dad to do this. He's, he'll be good guy. He's be a wingman. I need a wingman in these productions. Now we have so much going on. So let me bring up, I think Bob, Bob Gray, um, you said you were, um, uh, wanting to come up and uh, make a comment here. Right. Hi, Jack. Um, Hi. thanks so much for the presentation. It, it seems to me that um, you haven't defined what you mean by number. Um, for example, I'm wondering if you would start with an unsigned scalar as a number, and then you can do all operations, define your operations very clearly, what operations are allowable on scalars. Then you add an additional property so it's no longer a scalar, the additional property being, in this case, a direction. Now that's usually called a vector, and you can define your operations on vectors. You know, uh, what, what are the rules? For example, can you take the square root of a vector? I don't really know what that means. So it's, it's not just the operations that you seem to be uh, focused on in your presentation. It's also, I think, a basic concept of what you mean by number. Where are you starting? At what level? And then to go to the next level, what are you adding to that basic level definition? And then what are the operations at each level as you develop this concept of number and arithmetic and all the operations? That would be about the next 10 lectures that I would do where I do it to I take all of my math and do real problems from all the physics books and solve them using SM without any of their rules. And one of the big things I do is I uh, 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 photons moving and waves and springs, for example. One thing I do with springs is I don't I never start with where they start, where you have negatives and positives. If you start with a spring, say that's relaxed, and now you stretch it, you create a force to stretch it, and now you start it from there, uh, you can now use a simple sine function with nothing but moving back and forth in my math and, uh, and all things of springs moving back and forth become totally logical. I've got uh, hundreds of problems I've solved using my math, but the first two things I've done is just to show my symmetry math and then this broken symmetry math is why there's so many problems in it. 
And basically what I'd like to do from here uh, for, for future lectures is show how this is, how symmetry math is used in real life problems of everything to do with photon motion to uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, how they interact and everything using symmetry math. So by, by the way, I get rid of scalars and vectors. I don't want to use any of the words of traditional math because all of those mean something different. Like, uh, you know, uh, uh, two, two vectors multiplied by a cosine is a scalar. Two vectors multiplied by a sine is a vector and in the opposite directions. So you got cross products and dot products and uh, that, that whole math system that you, your brain just gets fried just looking at it. If, in other words, you take two, two of the same arrows and you do the cosine, you, you call it something different than if you used a sine angle. Because you used a different angle, you get a totally different answer. That's just illogical nonsense to me, and it's just totally not needed. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else in the green room, just raise your hand if you want to come up. Um, I also will uh, put some things up here from our chat. Let me see here. I'm trying to go backwards from it. Um, I guess that's one of the questions that was, uh, or, or mentioned was the, uh, dot products. And you had sort of, let me see if I can find that. Um, uh, again, let's see here, introducing the tip. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at, this can avoid of three directions. You cannot, so, okay, here we go. Um, I believe this is, if you do not understand the dot product of two velocity components, then you will say it is confusing. What would you mention, say about that? Is that just, you don't have dot products? So I, I don't have dots and cross products. Yeah, okay. I think they're just not needed in my system. Okay, okay. Now, an another thing I think that's really hard, and I, I have a, a, a question. Oh, it seems like, uh, this is a comment I have. Uh, I made a few while, you're, while, while I watched it. I watched it before. But it seems like the absolute value is some sense trying to get to sym symmetry math because it's trying to find make something as a direction sort of i mean yeah. it, it's sort it's 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 not a good solution but it seems to be trying to solve that problem the absolute value is it, am i reading that wrong no i think you're reading it correctly i mean the whole point is that if you have an illogical system what the human uh, the male human brain is capable of massaging that around and saying you know, I really didn't like this answer, so what can I do to make it an answer I would like? And it will actually wind up, no matter how you do it, give you a correct answer. So we, oh, I'll just invent a couple of gold posts and put them up there, and we'll change the answer that I don't like and the answer I do like. And since it always gives me the correct answer, why not just do it? Well, I think it's, I, I, I sort of get at that because, but again, I have uh, my degree, my my, my bachelor's is in math. One of the things I think of as absolute value in mathematics is really try to just get the sort of the length of what's going on, right? It doesn't matter sort of where it is. I look right. at it, not some arbitrary thing. The idea was, look, when we're doing this, you know, here's what happens here. And, and this is where you, you would go nuts with it. And I think this is where a lot of it goes wrong. So you're, you're, you know, my daughter comes home with mathematics problem. What is it? It's a word problem, right? And so you get this word problem of a real thing in the world. And so if you get a real thing in the world, it travels, it travels north in for five hours at 30 miles an hour. Then it stops and it's going to go back at 40 miles an hour for a half an hour. You know, how much is that? And so they put a number line out there and they'll put some point in your, you know, you're sitting in the middle, whatever. And then this absolute value is sort of a way to try to say, okay, we're sort of really de dealing with movement of something and those movements have directions. And since we're using this, we're going to use this special operator in this scan. So what, what kids learn is to use this operator in this particular point. But again, what, what they're really learning is, um, it's almost like when you write a computer program, right? And you know that the computer program, for instance, there's a big program, I can't remember what the name is at NASA. And it calculates all, it tries to calculate all of the 
10,000 objects in the solar system that are important, that are, are of, of some mass, literally, and tries to have their positions at all times. Well, they use, you know, pretty much Newtonian point mass uh, calculations, but they've also learned that things are, are changed and it's not really easy because everything tugs on everything, right? The gravitational field is not uniform and it's not just a point mass. So they start introducing these tricks and uh, calculations. And so what you'd end up doing is instead of rewriting the system to make it a better mathematical system where uh, a system where you figure out all the different um, all the objects together in the gravitational field and that's way more complicated, they tweak it. But now it seems like with the mathematical um, equa the um, the word the word problems, that you end up saying, oh, we're going to use this absolute value, which is sort of a hack, and you're going to learn how to use that hack, and you better learn because you're going to get the answers that way, and you get your grade and you go on, never thinking that you're using a system that's got problems that they've tried to hack it a little bit. Uh, is that is is that sort of your feeling of what's going on, or? I, I, that's a good definition. Uh, the one, the biggest one that comes up to me is a, the square root of a negative number. I mean, how do you build a mass system around numbers that don't exist? As soon as they found the number that didn't exist, why wouldn't they simply say, there's something wrong with the mass system. We need to change this. But instead, the male brain says, you know what? I think I can call this thing imaginary. And do this to it now i can get answers that that agree with what i want them to agree with and so they they always bypass the problem and build one that's even worse right uh here's a question from my father here he says what happens to sine and cosine tables now i know you say you're going to be talking about things in the, the maybe maybe hopefully you can come back and talk about some of the applications that you do but how would you, just to give you some context, my, my father and I are writing a book where there are no, we state categorically, there are no negatives in the universe. There are any. So and when, when we do calculations and he does calculations, what he tends to do is take a sine curve and basically move it above so there are no negative numbers. And what really the sine curve is, is like there's lots of particles at this point, there's none here, and there's more here. It's more like, you know, that kind of calculation. But his question is, what happens to the sine and cosine? Because in some sense, it's just a shift within their system. Do you only, do you need, can you throw out one? Um, I, in my system, I have, have removed the, the 360 degrees and, and I use both um, radians and degrees at uh, two pi. In other words, uh, and my system radians and degrees are the same. And so I have a sine cosine tangent table that's all based on two pi. And I use sines and cosines just like anything else where, where you're trying to solve a, a problem where an object's moving at some angle. Right, right. Okay. The sine and cosines are still in symmetry math. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, radians and degrees are the same in mind. You don't have to do that 57.3 conversion every time you're working with it. Okay, okay. All right, yeah, there were a couple of questions about that. I think this is another one he said, how does how do I use trig tables to do calculations? And what you're saying is it's based on two pi, right? Yes. Right, so it's really just, it's really a chart that goes from zero to two pi and all your answers will, will lie within that, right? Yeah. It's pretty simple. So uh, it's not going to lie on uh, 74 times 74 pi somewhere. So, okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, again, I have people in the gray room. Uh, if you want to, green room, gray room, what happened? I'm, I'm going colorblind. Uh, if you want to speak or make a comment. Oh, I see you on there. Um, Ian. Uh, Ian, I'll bring him up. Hey, Ian, how are you? Thank you. Um, fine, thank you, um, David. Um, thank you, Jack. Um, just one or two comments, if I may, and perhaps a question then. Um, the, the, the comments are, um, it, fr frankly, that, that I think we're really just discussing different conventions. I mean, um, w one can say one is more logical than another. Really, I think one is um, expressing one's preference for another. One is saying one is more beautiful or more simply expressed. And um, w when you look at things like, say, the Einsteinian uh, velocity compositions formula, 
Well, uh, I, I do agree that um, there are physical illogicalities with that. It doesn't seem to make sense, and you can actually show that physically it, it results in a contradiction. But that doesn't mean that the mathematics uh, is incorrect. I mean, the, the mathematics, you know, using the conventional system is actually correct. It, it may get so. So then, way there's a bit of confusion there. So you may wish to comment on that. But my question is this. Um, You've restricted yourself to uh, linear quantities. Um, so I, I, I presume that your arguments would also apply to angular quantities. Uh, I mean, in the conventional system, you have um, an angle which uh, conventionally uh, increasing in the anti-clockwise direction would be positive and in the clockwise direction would be negative. And, and we have, of course, the trigonometric functions which flow from that, giving positive and negative and all that sort of thing. I suppose your arguments could also apply to, to angular measurements. Oh, absolutely. And when I do the real uh, world problem solving from physics books, I, yeah, I, I use, uh, uh, I, I just don't have any negatives or positives in it. I just used uh, I suppose the easiest thing to do on this is not, I don't know how to give an answer without really showing something, but to actually do some real problem solving using uh, angles and uh, angular momentum and conservation of angular momentum, it, uh, everything uh, uh, would be to use real life problems showing how you use symmetry math. And I, I really don't agree uh, with the Einstein math being correct. It's just gobbledygook, nothing stuff that they put together. Yeah, maybe so, for example, you can, it, conventionally, um, an angle of plus uh, ninety degrees um, or pi over two would be the same as minus two hundred and seventy degrees. Right. Uh, would that that wouldn't apply in your case? Um. I, I uh, yes, I still use the 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 same circle. I just don't use the word negative. Two pies. I would probably use clockwise and counterclockwise. Okay, okay. So you do have negative uh, angles. Okay, th th thank you. Okay. Well, uh, wait a minute. I saw him. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I saw your eyes roll, Jack, when he when he said negative angles. <laughs> I'm not here again. I'm not trying to cause problems. But I'd, I'd like to. I would like to know what that. I'm sure Ewan would like to know what that eye roll was. There are no negative angles. There are no positive angles. It's just angles. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I guess what he's saying, Ian, and and it makes sense. It's it's not easy at times for. I mean. I got what he was doing right away when I saw his first number line. I got it. The problem is, is, is shifting. Your shi yeah, but it isn't. The counterclock, think of it this way, Ian. I just thought of this too. I, I agree with you. I'm still trying to grasp the symmetry math, right? The idea is, is that just like you can't point in a negative direction or a positive direction, an angle is an angle. Now, if you're from here going in this direction, it doesn't matter. It's still an angle, right? Or if you're from here and you're going in this direction, that's still an angle. Is that is that sort of what you were saying? Okay, let's look at it this way. Let's say I'm sitting across from you and we put a circle up and I'm, I'm sitting on this side, you're sitting on that side and someone shows a problem. I'm going to get an, I'm going to get an answer totally opposite of your answer. Because you're going to see it going one way. I'm going to see it going the other way simply because I sit across from you. But still, but still, it's a direction. It won't be negative, um, I because I, I well, unless you know, it's positive it will be. But if you don't, in other words, we if he put an arrow up, we would see the same direction. But if you call it negative and I call it positive, we will see different math. Okay, so so in other words, I would I guess then you would in the symmetry math you would have a, our arrows would be pointing in different directions. If we have an arrow pointing in either direction and we sit across from each other, we will both see the arrow moving in that direction. But if I use the words negative and positive and now we start multiplying these things, I'm going to see a totally different answer than you are. Let's say I'm sitting across from you and we use just a Cartesian coordinate system. And also, this is my negative side. This is my positive side. 
this is going to be your negative side and your positive side. So if I say I multiply something here by something here, my system says it goes over here. Your system, no, it doesn't. It stayed over there. So it depends on where you're sitting when you use the word negative and positive with anything. And so if you get rid of that and you just put arrows up and right. you want the magnitude of an arrow, you put a number, everybody but, does the same thing. But what I'm saying to you is, I think what I'm saying is correct, I think, um, which is, depending on where I'm sitting, my arrow for the calculation is going to be different. The direction is different from yours. Right? Because if I have something that's yeah. moving, if, if, if I have something, I mean, I would draw it on paper. Let's just say we do this on paper and we're making a system of we're trying to put it all into one, you know, one number, which is not probably reasonable. It's probably better to break it down into three, uh, you know, dimensions or whatever. But if I, I draw it, I'm, I see it like it's going this way. So uh -huh. my five would have an arrow pointing that way. Your five would have an arrow pointing that way if you're looking from the opposite side. Yes. Okay. So what I'm saying is that the arrow would be different because of, of the direction from where I'm observing it. If I were to, I guess what it is, it's sort of, I mean, I've seen this and I'm sure I don't think it, I think this, I think in symmetry math, it's probably not a good way. One, this, I guess this is a question too. I'm going to, did you have anything else, um, uh, Ian or... No, no, I, I think, um, thanks very much. You've, you've sort of answered my question. But, but my, my point, my basic point, and I don't know if you wish to comment on it or not, but is that um, these things are really conventions. I, I don't think they're, they're absolutely true. And one may prefer one system to another. But, 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 but it, you know, I leave it at that. Because I find that um, some of these quantities which baffle the mind, like imaginary numbers and negative numbers and whatever, they're very useful in the real world. They, 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 they result in, in values. I mean, you talked about your system encapsulating sines and cosines. But I mean, if you add the um, cosine of, of, of an angle to I times the sine of an angle, you, you get a fundamental quantity, you know, E to the I of that angle and things like that. And they're very, very useful in the real world. So. Uh, you know, I'll probably leave it at that unless you want to comment on it in much detail. And, Thank and you. That would just be a future thing where I show real world where you don't need to use any of that. You can just well, use symmetry math and solve all of those. That would be interesting. Yeah, but I, I, I will try to answer your question, Ian, okay? Because maybe, you know, so, you know, I've thought about this uh, as well. Here's what I would say. What, what, what the problem is, is not, I agree with you, because my father and I have thought this, about the same thing. Here, here's a really good example. Uh, in our book, we, we dedicate a lot of our book to explain the physicality, the physics of everything, every, every force inside electrical components and electric circuit, everything. It's not like you have fields anywhere. The field's made up of stuff and those stuff you can, we talk about. Um, if you look at electrical engineering, I believe there is, they use uh, the square root of negative one in electrical engineering. Now, the question is, is yeah, my dad would say, and I wish he would be uh, maybe Pop, Pop Painter, but he was an electrical engineer for 40 years. And he used a system with, you know, like current and, and you know, I, uh, all the equations for um, um, the electronic circuits. And he says, yes, you can use the system well. But I think what happens is, is not, that isn't the problem I, I see. The problem is when you look at special relativity and you look at quantum mechanics, and you look at other things similar, what happens is the physicists will mix up what they're doing, just like in special relativity, not understand, because we have looked at it much closer, right, Ian? You have, um, Jack has, I have, Karazani has. We've looked at special relativity and realized that the math, what they're saying and the math operations they are doing don't add up. But I think what Jack is saying isn't that, and, and I agree with him, is that it's not just a convention. It's a, only a convention if it doesn't get you into trouble. If I were to hand you two languages to speak, to go to this new uh, place, and one language you would say, oh, they both will tell you the same thing. But you end up finding out that of those two languages I give you, 2% of the time, it gets you into real trouble and you can't get out of it because you're following the rules, but it, 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 it fails. So what I'm, what I would say is that uh, symmetry math and the math. So what we have is just like any other system. We have 
Newton's equation for gravity. It's it's a it's approximation. It treats everything as a dot. Normally, they they treat it as a point mass. But you get into trouble if you get things like you know even going between two masses. The thing is, is that the system that we use has the real mathematics has all these absolute values come in, all these other rules, and we've learned to live with an imperfect system. The question then becomes, why do that if we can find out what those problems are and come up with a better system so we don't end up with 105, 110 years of special relativity still permeating our physics when if we would have had a system like symmetry, uh, symmetry math, you couldn't have done it because it, you, you can't do that. So I think that's what it is. I don't agree with you in the sense that Real, ma real mathematics, a real number system, what we call the real number system and symmetry math are equal and it's just a preference. No, I, there, I think we have real number system which we have tried to get around problems. The square root of negative one is a perfect example. To me, that's not a good system. It's a system with hacks and those hacks got us into trouble enough that made special relativity. Look what it's, look at the habits wrote. So I think, in not my opinion, that would be the answer. I don't see it as, both are equal. I don't see that. I see you can use them for a lot of great things because we have. But what I think what Jack's saying is if you look at special relativity and quantum mechanics, for instance, you've got two things that dominate physics. And if you were to use the symmetry math, perhaps we wouldn't be there. Now, that to me is, I don't know, does that sort of... Uh, well, well th that's something which would be interesting to come back to, David. Uh, I, I mean, maybe Jack or yourself or somebody else could give a talk on that. I mean, that would be revolutionary if, if, if one maintained that by introducing a system or had had we introduced a system such as this you wouldn't have had all the nonsense of special relativity or yeah. quantum mechanics arising that would be something that you'd have to demonstrate because i would think that more fundamentally these errors came from incorrect postulates i i, I mean i don't think the mathematics is is, is very wrong in these systems they sort Ooh, of wait, 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 wait a minute wait a minute i understand what you're saying i will push back on that a little bit just in my again this is sort of a us talking, um, sort of an open discussion. Um, no, no, that's not true. Um, if you look at, if you go and study Karazani's work, you'll find out that there are two errors he found. One was a mathematical error. The other one was a physics error, meaning it didn't jive with the math, didn't jive with what was going on physically. So uh, um, I think that that happens and i and i think especially in special relativity and if you go look at uh, karazani's work he shows there's a two-thirds instead of a one-third and then the two velocities being uh, uh, multiplied which couldn't really ever be multiplied so i would push back on that and say no uh, i i would say that exactly what you're saying in the beginning it is revolutionary that's why i was wanting to write the paper to compare Karazani's work with Jack's work, because what you said is very true. You picked up on that right away. And I think that's pretty brilliant. I mean, you picked that up and that is, yeah, I truly believe if we had symmetry math in the early 1900s and everybody was using it, couldn't do special relative, it wouldn't work. People would just start, start doing the math and go, Tch, would have happened. We would have went right past it. Yeah, that's revolutionary. It really is. Okay, well, perhaps we'll, we'll come back to that, as I say, uh, at a later stage. But uh, anyways, thank you so much. I don't, I don't mean to jump on, on you, but it's when you come on, you have very stimulating <laughs> comments. All right, but thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. But I mean, I think that is true, Jack. I think it's really important. I've got Harry Ricker waving his hand viciously here. I'll get him in. But I want to just finish this up, um, is that uh, yeah, I mean, if we have systems that are more consistent, symbolic system, I, I really truly believe what you're saying, because I'm a mathematician, like I said, I'm not a person that doesn't know math. I love math. It's really great. But, you know, when you get to the, all these other problems, square root, and then you start dealing with physics, it gets problematic. And, you know, how much of what we do today, I mean, it's a great question Ian has, how much would we are, do we believe today that went awry because of our symbolic ma manipulations of a negative sign meaning 17 different things, right? A minus sign. Yes, I agree. I, I, um, I think 
Um, the reason I'm interested is because bas your basic philosophy of um, present your ideas, and if you people in the group like it, we'll form groups and see where we can take it. If you don't like it, you know, continue on with your path. And basically what I've done so far is present the basics of symmetry math and why I and numerous errors that I have found in the traditional system. And what I want to go home forward with now is how to use symmetry math in the real world. I don't I basically don't even want to talk about broken symmetry math anymore. Just want yeah, to no, no, I agree. I agree. I think that's really, really important. So yeah, some good comments here. Um, I know uh, Harry wants to come up here, but no, I agree. Uh, just before, again, I want to finish this before I bring up Harry. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree with it. I think what happens is we know this has caused problems, special relativity is a poster child for um, a real math, you know, the real math system going wrong. And what can we do to uh, basically you can take what I would say is you take the real math, the symmetry, symmetry math, keep developing it, making sure we come up with the way it works right with, you know, the ans ampersand operator and all that. And then when we st start applying this across the board, where are we going to get in trouble? Are we going to find out that our calculations for gravity waves, which happens to be very similar to something like special relativity, um, it, are going to be in trouble? Are we going to get in trouble with other uh, things you had also with quantum mechanics? So that's, yeah, I agree. We should try to apply it and see what's going on because um, will that, you know, help? I, I, you know, I think it, it would, it can help. So let me bring up uh, Harry Ricker. Electrical engineer, great writer, by the way. If you haven't read Harry Rickers on sciencewoke.org, check it out. I love his work. He's a really great writer. Hey, Harry, how are you? Okay, David, here's my comment. Or I have a couple of thoughts, one on special relativity, one on this math system. You can invent math systems all you want, and it's a preference as to which one you want to use, but the requirement is it has to be self-consistent. So the real test is, Really, Jack, is your system self-consistent? Um, is there a place within it that produces a contradiction? That's the test of whether your system is good or not. The other test is whether or not it's applicable to a particular problem. Okay, so here's the issue in my mind. Physicists basically take a math system without understanding how the math system, what's appropriate math system to apply to a physical problem. That's the problem that we have here. Special relativity takes the real number system and these rules of math and basically applies it incorrectly because they violate a rule of algebra called the unique identity element theorem, which says you can't create a math system that has two different reference points. You can't solve an equation when you have two different reference points and use that system to solve a problem in mathematics. You just discussed that, David. You pointed that out to him. You have two different reference points. I have a reference point, and Jack has a different reference point. We cannot agree on the math solution to that problem. I you don't know what agree. that... Wait, 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 wait. I'm not... I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think that's you the thing. You have to have an agreement where you both only agree to one reference point. There can only be one reference point. If you don't do that... Oh, yeah, yeah. You violate the unique identity element system in mathematics. That says you can't produce a unique solution. So... If you have two different reference points, Einstein uses a system where he takes two different coordinate systems, two different reference points, and tries to solve equations and get answers, but his answers aren't unique. They give contradictions. So his system is contradictory. No. The problem no. is, no. yes, it is. No, it okay, isn't. Okay, the, is, the problem is the physicist said, the experimental evidence proves that Einstein's system, which we know is mathematically inconsistent, produces contradictions, is right because the experiments proved it's right. Okay, so they're using two different criteria of truth, experimental truth and mathematical truth. And then they say, oh, experimental truth proof trumps mathematical truth. 
Well, even That's experimental cool. proof in 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 uh, uh, particle accelerators. When I in my movie, I have Dr. Kelsey saying they have to unteach special relativity for people in in particle accelerators. So, but as to your 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 question, that we would get different answers. No, what 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 I see it is okay. is Jack and I. No, but <laughs> hear me out. Hear you just, me out. You just went through a whole discussion. No, 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 no. But hear me out. Hear me out. What the result is, what I will have from my point of view will be saying over there, right over there, and I can point to it, this is a, a, a spaceship that I see or a satellite, it's moving in that direction at that speed. Jack, from his point of view, will say that, but he'll be pointing in a different direction. But the, uh, the conclusion of him and I calculating with symmetry math as to where that, that is, and I have to go find it by sending a probe out, I am in a different position. If I have to send my drone out to it and he has to send his drone out to it, we are still saying that that satellite that we're going to have our drone go to or our rocket go to are going to be that, that we are saying the exact same thing about that satellite. It's just that when I see it, it's not moving in this direction, it's moving in that direction. That does not change change that our calculations have as a as me in Australia and he is in the United States that that is where that that object is in the sky and we both have to meet up with it with my spaceship and his spaceship yeah we get different calculations because we're in different places and we, but we say that that place that our answer is in physics is that that place we both came up with the correct answer that we will both be able to send a plate uh, um, uh, a rocket or a drone to that same position and that what we see as that thing moving in that direction the answers are the same harry uh would you state your first two statements over again because i agreed with them a hundred percent and i and those first two statements well, uh, you have no. Here's your. Here's the problem, Jack. You have no proof that your system is uh, self-consistent. You have well, to prove yes, to have, I do. To have, I have a mathematical have system. True. You have okay. to prove have to that, that, that it's self-consistent. Fifty articles that I can do on this show, and and so you haven't. The only thing you've seen is two starting articles. I've worked out hundreds and hundreds of physical things showing that my system is exactly like your first thing. And you are hundred percent correct until yeah. I can prove it. You're right. I'm wrong. Sure. 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 But as I soon as I, can show well, I haven't seen your proof of self-consistency. And so, you know, my other real, my, the main thing I have is I don't understand what you're talking about. Doesn't make any sense to me. I can't figure it out. I'll let you do what you want to do your way. You can solve problems your way. I, I'm not going to use your system because I don't understand it. That's the big problem that you're going to have. Um, the other point I was trying to make is that people don't define their mathematical system that they're using. Okay. And one of the problems I think that you have is you're trying to make arithmetic become vector theory. And I, to me, I can understand why you're doing that, but I mean, Apply, using arithmetic as if it's vectors is, you know, I, I don't understand why you want to try to do that. So that's, um, I'm that's just confused. Why I, I, that's why I'm actually on this program because there are a lot of people who do see uh, benefit in what I'm doing. And for the people who do, we're going to develop it. And for People who believe like you, you should develop your theories, which I'm, which are all over this, I'm sure. And you, are, I'm sure that you're going to stick with yours. I have no, no intention of even wanting you to to look at my stuff because you said. Well, not I, I guess we can agree to disagree. But my point yes. here, this is my point. Yeah. My point is that when you solve a physical problem, and David, you were talking about this, where you were talking about students in school. The thing is that mathematics. You can't apply one mathematical system to solve every problem. You, you I have to that. use a different now set of yeah, principles in. and postulates, and you have so to know on. which principles and postulates you're using when you solve a particular problem. And what happened in special relativity was they just took the real number system and their standard mathematics and applied it to the special relativity problem, but they did it wrong. And that produced all these contradictions and absurdities. And then they said, well, but because we've got experimental proof that says this theory looks like it's right, therefore, we're going to accept this mathematics, even though it produces these contradictions. 
that's really not how you should go about solving problems in physics. I disagree. Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, yeah. I understand. He, I think the statement is disagreement, which I do too. Is that uh, what was it the application, right? Um, can you tell us, Jack? I can't remember what he said. There was something he he went on there. <laughs> I'm sorry. This I'm sorry. is a very complicated. You can't apply incorrect mathematics, okay, to a physical problem. Okay, that's what they did. They applied oh, incorrect mathematics to a physical problem. I remember. And they looked out there and they said, oh, we've got some experiments that confirm our theory, although the mathematics they were using in the theory was wrong. So they said, the theory is correct, even though the mathematics produces contradictions. Well, if it produces contradictions, it can't be self-consistent. Right, right. And that has to be proven yet to a lot of people about symmetrical math. I know what he was saying. The thing that was a trigger, and I and I disagree with um, Harry on that one, too, is that um, symmetric, symmetric, symmetry math can be applied to everything. And I, the way I look at it is the world, the, the universe to which we are calculating, the universe to which we are calculating is all made of moving mass, in my opinion. So if I believe that, then symmetry math will be able to describe everything. Is that what you were, uh, were you, you, I, when he said that, I think that's when you were disagreeing, right, Jack, is, if I read that? I agree with your statement you just yeah. made. Okay. I yeah. disagree with Harry. Yeah, okay, so that was where the what disagreement What do you disagree came with? That Wait, symmetry what's, what's the basis of the disagreement? The sem you said oh, symmetry yeah. math can't be applied to everything. And then well, you apply your rules. I, I don't think you can prove that that's wrong because you would have to apply it to an infinite number of problems in order to prove it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But I, I, what I'm my saying point again is, my point is, I don't understand it, so I'm not going to use it. That's that's fine. I mean, that's what and that's what that's what happens can, with all you can you can apply it to all the problems you want to, and. But I'm not going to agree with any of those solutions because I don't understand your mathematics. So you have a real problem there. We have I, a problem. Well, we have a problem with you. That's fine. Yeah, we have a problem. It's, it you. doesn't mean that your problem translates to everybody else because it doesn't translate. Yeah, to but answers. you're you're going to go against the official physics community and all the teachers in oh, colleges and colleges and universities, and so they're not going to be convinced. So I think I think but you that's would be true. better off. No, no, because because in, in reality, if you look, the very first thing I did as a dissident or a critical thinker when I met Karazani was to go to Long Beach Library and pick out what makes things change. What is a paradigm shift, as Thomas Kuhn says? And what happens is you never have the case where even in Newton in his time, where everybody switched over and everything's fine. You have to have people who cling on to whatever they, they were learned. And they said, I mean, Alvarez, Louis Alvarez told, who, who won the Nobel Prize, told Karazani, he says, look, you may be right about this, but I'm too old to worry about it and have it change. So what happens is you're right. There's no reason for us to ever think that mainstream will ever go along with this. No one, no one will. What will happen is we have well, to be I'm out there. Well, I'm not going along with it, David, because I don't understand it. Well, I understand. Okay, I mean, so that's why a lot of people don't right use. There. Yeah, you that's got a one problem right there. I mean, the dissident, I mean, I'm, I i don't agree with everything mainstream says. I don't have a clue what you're talking about, Jack. Not a clue. Don't understand any of it. And it's just completely gone over my head. So whatever it is that you're doing, you're, you've lost a large part of your audience right at the get-go. That's your, I don't know where you get, do you have statistical proof of what you just said? No, I'm just saying, I don't understand <laughs> it. I don't think a lot of other people do either. That's, that's just Well, I don't, I, I I'm see. sure that can be, I, I'm sure that is. I'm sure that is. The idea that the whole universe is made of moving mass and, you know, that's, that's something <laughs> people can't grasp either. So, yeah, there's always going to be people that don't grasp it. So, but anyways, I, did you have any other comments before I, uh, we uh, move on here or? Nope. I guess not. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I know. I mean, those absolutely, you know, interesting remarks. I think the, one of the most interesting, re well, as to statistically, whether or not symmetry math won't be understood because, you know, I know Harry doesn't understand. It means other people won't understand it for sure. For sure. I mean, I think, I think part of it has to do, there's a lot of mind shift and I, I think it brings up a really good point, Jack. There's a lot of shifting that has to go on 
for a person to arrive at these kinds of notions. I mean, you, you know, I, th I, th I think one part of it is one of the things you and I have in common is Burkert's work, right? Yes. Uh, and, and, and if, you know, before Burkert came along, I just never even contemplated infinity. My father and I started, you know, he was working on uh, what I think is one of maybe the only solution I've seen, a ver you know, a real verifiable solution for the particle wave duality solution but at that time he didn't know borker to even talk about infinity now when we talk he and i it's part of our vocabulary that everything is moving mass and i think what 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 the shift is is to for a person to understand that that that's really where it's at because if you believe I, maybe I'm, I'm just trying to explain what i understand about why i was excited to see this math system versus a real number system which i've hey i made a uh, a career out of using it, right? I mean, uh, what what I think it is, is that when you have to use, a, I, I guess I look at it this way, what's good is math. Math is only good for us because it helps us do things in the universe, in the real universe. You know, who, who cares if I have 20, 12 oranges and, you know, I need to, to describe in an equation that I give three away, right? That's mathematics in the end has to serve some purpose in our world. And the thing is, is that if you look at real, the real number system, you know, Ian was talking about it, yeah. And other people say, I'll, I'll keep with that math system. Well, you'll keep with it. And we'll also have to live with problems of going a hundred years off when special relativity would never have been allowed to do that if our system really re was reflecting, our mathematics really reflected the physical world. Let's go to a slightly different uh, thing. Okay. That because I'm a, I spent five years studying the brain and how it functions so I could help people with their golf swings. And one of the books is uh, The Synaptic Self by Dr. Joseph Ledo. And what he shows is that you are your synaptic patterns. The patterns that you build are set up permanently in the cortex of your brain. And for you to think differently is probably the most difficult thing for a human to do. So someone like Harry has spent his life with this traditional math system, the broken symmetry math system. His brain cells are so set that that is correct because he considers it to be um, whatever he considers it to be. And he was totally incapable of even probably even listening to this presentation. And I'm sure he didn't see the symmetry math presentation. And so what we're looking at is people's brains that, aren't capable of looking at something different, although they're on this site, which is supposed to be, I don't agree with you and I'm not going to use your stuff. But uh, he was pretty adamant about, uh, I was just wrong. Well, no, I think, I think I'll give you some other insights from my side, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I work, I work with supercomputers. I also work in the area of artificial intelligence for over 30 years yeah. and we know how the brain works. We can mimic it. We can, we use the brain net neural networks today to do things that are amazing. For instance, here's a real simple uh, area. If you have Photoshop today and you now want to remove somebody at the beach, you used to have to sort of cut them out and then try to paste by hand what's going on behind it. We now have neural networks that can look at the, this photo, get that side of it and come up with a general pattern that will be able to recreate a random, very similar pattern behind where that person was standing so that you don't, you see clouds, you see, you see all those things. This is done with neural networks. Why? Because they're very good at taking in lots of information and coming up with patterns. That's what you do. You see a face, a human face enough times that you get a pattern what that human face is. Now, the question, as you said, is becomes into the human brain. How far do we go? Are there certain things that become completely hardwired? And what we have found that that certain brains, the chemi chemical in the brains, makes some people harder to change because what happens is when their neural network chemically sees all this input, it then comes up with what we, you know, it, 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 it uh, how do you say, normalizes so that when we, after we see 2000 faces, we've got a pretty good idea of what a face is. And if we see another face we've never seen, it will fire those thing, those synaptic gaps and those connections. What makes a neural network are the connections. So here's one neuron. It's got a connection to all these other neurons. And the strengths of those connections make you swing your golf club in a certain way to get you to change that 
can be really, really hard. It is difficult. <laughs> right. And so the question is some brains and some human brains, and I think that's why in personalities, it's really hard to change them. They're very good. They recognize it. But chemically, their brains just don't want to change, especially as they get older. There are some studies done with linguistics that if you learn languages after puberty, you are always going to have a an accent. There are a few people that that doesn't happen. The only thing we can say is that, yeah, those brains are, brains are more pliable. It's tough. It really is tough. And I think one of the things that triggers some of us is that you see something, even like yourself, Jack, you see something that's been going on that bothers you, like, like the square root of negative one, right? It bothers you. So you go in and you investigate it. And if you can, if you can put down in a book, if you can put down in lectures, if you can put down in talks that you do enough foundation that a person can follow through that logic, that's what we call teaching. And maybe that rewiring will happen, right? Well, I think you probably could have written symmetry math. And as soon as you saw mine, it's probably what you could have written. You said, ah, oh, damn it. Why did he write that before I did? Well, I saw, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I saw the yeah. number line and yeah. I understood it in literally 10 seconds. I understood what was going on. And then it made me very curious. And then when I saw that you were putting together things that Borker was talking about, and then I saw you see, end up showing that, well, the mathematical system does have problems and that relativity, special relativity. And I, and I, that's how I got into this. I spent years working and with trying to understand the real math system and what Karazani said in words, right? Because what you have to do is you have to say at this point, and if you go to autodynamics.org, people want to see it. You can go there where the derivation, where he shows at this point, this V and this V. Like, you know, like Harry said, you know, there's a problem there. It's a problem mathematically, Karazani found mathematically and conceptually in the physical world. And I guess what I would say, the paradigm shift that I see that you're doing in mathematics and why my father, I included it in our book, is that I see it as us stop saying, okay, folks, we got to get away from our own systems. I mean, we have computer systems that have nothing to do with the physical world, right? They're just conceptual programs that manipulate things. But if we have a mathematics system that does all the things that the real number system does, but it keeps us away from the problems of the physicality, getting into the wrong, the problems of, of it being have having uh how do you say paradoxes it has problems when you go and do operations that the operation rules f are, are not consistent why not shift to one that does so we don't get into these problems like quantum mechanics or special relativity i mean that's what what i see and yeah like you said and i say you know um go for it if you think this is terrible don't look at it. Don't use it. Um, if this is interesting to you, then do it. Uh, I do see, though, and I will say this, that Borkert's work, the um, no charge, no. Oh, that was my other question. Um, what do you see from your point of view? I'm just curious with symmetry math, you know, having no negative and positive to something like an electron and a proton or negatives and positives that happen in physics where you write these magical numbers, the symbols on them and they attract. Did, yeah. did, did anything in your, I, I'm just curious from coming from the purely mathematical system side and symmetry math, did something click on that side as well? I mean, I can see it just by physical forces, but yeah, Turner Rev's work. I, I I spent ten years, you know, working on translating his work, and so it's Turner Rev's work that that um, uh, defines uh, physics and chemistry uh, using classical math. And when I substitute my math, it makes even more sense. Okay. 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 Yeah. I. I, th yeah. I okay. charge myself. I. I'm have presentations where I'd like to show that what's called current is actually photon flow. And well, well what charge actually is, and this was uh, uh, by several people put this up, it's actually uh, mass times the uh, classical radius times e to the plus seven. And if you put that in anything that has a charge, it'll give you the charge. So charge is math times the spinning radius. 
of the magnetic field. Yeah, well, just to give you an idea, in our, uh, um, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, sending you, because uh, we're having people read our book before we publish it. Yeah, but in, in, our, in our book, uh, basically, these are the, th to summarize it, um, we have evidence that gravity travels the speed of light. The uh, two Chinese experiments during a full eclipse have that. Of course, electricity supposedly goes, goes at the speed of light. Um, light, of course, goes at the speed of light. And magnetism, which is used to accelerate particles, accelerate particles at the speed of light. So we, I made the conjecture that they're the same particle. So the particle that makes up, the, it's just the way the particles move that make up, you know, that would be electricity, light, uh, gravity, magnetism, they're all the same particle, you know, one's, yes. uh, yeah, so, so we, we're, that's why when I saw, and it creates it, yeah, yeah, so anyways, I'll send you that part of it, but um, yeah, I, 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 I see what you mean, yeah, um, I think it's, again, it is a paradigm shift, I think people are going in this direction, that's why I was sort of, ex I, we're not the only ones that are saying these kinds of things, so it's not just me, you, and my father, and a couple other people. I think there's uh, Borkert, I think, too, would tend to agree that this system is worth looking at. And yeah, I mean, when, when Harry said it's got to be self-consistent, sure. And I think what happens, and let's say that uh, symmetry math became more and more popular, that eventually somebody who's good at mathematics, symbolic manipulation, will have to come up with what's considered to be a a good proof or accepted proof that the consistency of symmetry math is is there right yeah and and, and, and I, I don't I on that part yeah and and you know i think that's going to be you know i think it's it's funny because we have a a model that supposedly describes everything in the universe and people go well how, do, how about this i said look we're two people we have our new rules like you have new rules for symmetry math how can you yourself it's going to be help if people like it other people will latch on to it and it, and further it. over in the comments section someone has jack do you have those kerner of translations available and the answer is yes uh and and uh everything that that he's done photons electrons protons electrodynamics uh what heat really is and using his theories of heat and the photon i've actually rewritten all of thermodynamics i get rid of the first and second laws and entropy all together and right, you right. run three simple equations that you can do all of all of heat with and it's right. his work uh, so no that's uh, good and i think what we need to do is we need to get that organized right send an email to kg golf at uh sorry uh, to send an email to k-u-y-s-g at aol.com okay um let me see if i have that um a-U-Y-S-G at AOL.com. This is from Bob Gray. Here, uh, wait a minute. I, I have, oh, I have it right here. I've got this, I've got this email right there, kggolf.net. Right? No, that's my golf site. Don't do that one. <laughs> well, which one do you want? K-U-Y. Okay, K-U-Y-S-G at AOL.com. K-U-Y-S-G at AOL.com. Here. Okay, that one there? Yes. Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, yeah, Kai's Kai is science group at AOL.com. <laughs> okay, all right, so yeah, you can get in contact with that. And like I said, we'll send you what we have too because it, it agrees with you know, symmetry math quite a bit. So, okay, um, we are past our time, but uh, I want to thank you so much again. Uh, obviously, it was very stimulating, a lot of a lot of comments, and I apologize for not getting to everybody's comments today. Um, I do need help if you're interested in helping out. What I need is a wingman to sort of, sort of do that. But thank you very much, Jack, for your contributions. And it would be great for maybe us to set up a future time where we go a little bit more on uh, the application side um, that you were talking about, um, maybe even sines and cosines, those kinds of things. So what do you think? Oh, yeah, I, I can do a presentation. And I'm actually going to take uh, I, this one was up on YouTube. I'm actually going to take all of those and put them individually up on YouTube and just make a whole YouTube thing of all of them. Right. And we actually, you actually have a YouTube channel I saw right now, right? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. So I think if you look up uh, your name and symmetry math, it's brand new. I saw you only had eight subscribers. So I think you just started uh, um, a short time ago, right? Yes. Yeah. So go 
show your love and like for um uh, that's the way it works today go subscribe to look up jack kirkendall 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 up uh, and symmetry math you'll get to his um i think this video that you showed is on there today right so if you haven't seen that you can watch it in its entirety and subscribe folks like it helps support even if you don't understand it at least help and uh and oh wait i, I think i had one more question here um uh, for for uh, i know we've been over but what the heck um i, I think farouk had a question that was pretty interesting but um uh, we'll get that another time. I'm sorry about that, Farouk. I did see that. But again, that's why I need somebody. Thank you again, Jack, for everything. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks, Dave. Okay. So um, thank you once again, everybody, for your support. This was totally fantastic. And um, let me get these banners down here. And uh, we, of course, are here every Saturday. If you're interested in presenting, let us know. Um, and we're going to we're gonna get ourselves out of here. It's already eight minutes past our normal time. Hey, folks, and remember what I say. Stay critical, stay thinking. I'm Dave D. Hilser, science therapist, trying to get you to the promised land of becoming a critical thinker, not telling you what to believe or what is truth. Ciao for now.